golden child Remember the golden sun that used to drive you Our sisters, our brothers, our sons, our daughters, our friends, and our loved ones. As they glow through the night, lighting the darkness, they represent our shared vision for a cancer-free future. We deeply love the people these luminarias represent. We remember them. We celebrate them and we fight back against this disease for them. <laughs> Tonight I'd like to talk to you about um, both the science and the spirit of cancer care. Um, the science of, of cancer has progressed dramatically. As a surgeon, um, the history of the turn of the century was that we took out large portions of the body. We um, when, it, when the cancer came back, we assumed that the, we didn't do a good enough job, and so we, would, we grew and grew and took out more and more. We've discovered in the last few decades that we've done too much. In the past, even when I started in the 70s, we would, for breast cancer, we would take off the breast, the muscles, we'd split the sternum, we'd go in behind and we'd take out the lymph nodes. For colon cancer, we would remove a large portion of the bowel. And for head and neck cancers, we do radical necks, including removing the vessels of the neck so that the patient was grossly disfigured. Now with breast cancer, we no, no longer not take the muscles of the chest wall. We never split the sternum. We don't argue about taking off just the breast. We now most commonly take off just the tumor. We don't take off the tumor plus a half an inch of normal tissue around it. It's shrunk from a half an inch to a quarter of an inch, and now it's an eighth of an inch. We've found that we don't have to take the lymph nodes out of the armpit most of the time, typically just one. Colon cancer therapy is now done not through an eight-inch incision, but a two-inch incision, and radical neck surgery is rarely done. Chemotherapy has progressed. It was originally discovered as a nerve agent, mustard gas, used in World War II. It was found to um, inhibit solid tumors, and with that, they continue to investigate and find new agents. The agents in the 50s and 60s were agents that essentially were controlled toxins. And the way it worked was you gave just enough to inhibit the cancer without affecting the rest of the body, and patients were miserable. In the 60s, they finally figured out that they should give more than one, combine it. And unfortunately for the next two and a half decades, all they did was play with those agents and try to fine tune them against different tumors. In the 90s, things got pretty exciting. We started realizing that the tumor cells had receptors on them and we could actually target those cells. And we could, instead of giving patients controlled poisons, we can now target chemotherapy to the, the tumor itself. I was at the cancer center just last week when we were arguing with the use of a new genetic test. The test now tests the DNA that a tumor cell grows, or has, excuse me, and we can determine whether or not the tumor actually will respond to chemotherapy. Most importantly, whether that tumor has the propensity to spread. If it doesn't, Chemotherapy is not required. 
for a guy like me, a surgeon, that's kind of, I, I, that's kind of poetic justice because, you know, this therapy started with us, and I always like winning with the chemotherapy docs, but they're not required anymore, just me. The second half of the science and the spirit of cancer care is the spirit, the emotional side. For those of us that work at the cancer center, this is a very important part of what we do. I have the privilege of working with six medical oncologists, the specialist that gives you the chemotherapy, with five surgeons like myself, ear, nose, and throat docs, dermatologists that deal with skin cancer, three pathologists, multiple radiologists, three radiation oncologists. We have an entire team and we meet every week to discuss our patients. Approximately 95% of our patients are, are spoken of in that room prior to their care. So you might meet one of us, but all of us are taking part in what it is we need to do for you. More importantly, for myself, I'm a man of faith. I'm not here to preach to you tonight, but, it's, but I can tell you that I worship every week and I almost every day wake up and understand the tenets and try to learn the tenets of my faith. It teaches me that both good and things happen are, are part of our lives and that, and that is what builds the character of our lives. For those of you that have walked this journey of cancer, you know that this is a tough road. I can tell you from my own experience, not with cancer, but, but in the ups and downs of my life, it's the tough times that make us grow. It's those difficulties that we look back on and we look and say, yeah, that was a horrible time. That was a tough journey, but I'm better because of it. It make, makes you refocus on what's important, not the size of your TV, not the car you drive, but the people around you, the people that love and support you like most of you here, and the effect that we can have on those people we care for. The second tenet of my belief is that I will endure, that I will be given the strength to move forward. People ask me what my job is at the Cancer Center and how I deal with my patients. I perceive myself to be a coach. I'm expected to treat people with the surgical skills that I possess, but more importantly, is to encourage people through this process. Oftentimes, I'm the one that, that uh, I don't know if you say privilege, is the one that tells patients that, yes, I'm sorry, that mass of yours is a tumor. My job is to be honest. Does anybody here know what the, the number one surgical lie is that a surgeon uses? It's not gonna hurt. It's a lie. It's gonna hurt. We can do surgeries, like I said, through smaller incisions. We can take less out because we have the ad the advent of, of very effective chemotherapy now and very targeted radiation care. But it's still going to be a process. It's still going to be uncomfortable. As far as I'm concerned, the road of a cancer patient is like an athletic event. And I'm there to help you. I'm there to guide you. But I'm also there to push you. If if this is an athletic event, and I, I personally believe that cancer is probably the most stressful thing a person can hear or go through, then this indeed is like the Olympics. And for those of you who have survived, as far as I'm concerned, you are a gold medal winner. My prayer for you tonight in closing is that you take this tough journey you look around you and appreciate what it has taught you. You don't f forget to fight, but maybe for the first time you allow those that you've cared for, care for you. My prayer is that your character continues to grow, your generosity continues to be displayed to those that you love.